Uh, hey everyone, uh, I'm going to give a talk about the web native file system, which is a versioned and encrypted uh, file system on IPFS. So, first of all, hey everyone, <laughs> everyone. I'm Philip. Um, you can find me as Matthias23 on like various kind of uh, internet networks. And uh, I work at Fission. And what we've been doing at Fission for the past couple of years is we've put encrypted data onto IPFS from browsers. And so the way I like to think about this, and personally how I like to explain it is kind of like a data backpack is what we try to build, right? So this is Winnie. Uh, this is our mascot for WinFS. Uh, it's slightly altered, this image. It's not the original author's intent, so to say, but uh, Dali helped me out, uh, put a backpack on her. And basically, uh, she wants to have her data in her backpack and uh, take it to different devices. So all of her devices now have her data, similar to like a Dropbox or something. Uh, but she also wants to bring this data to different apps that she uses. So there may be a, like uh, a music player like Diffuse, uh, some Drive app that is similar to Google Drive or whatever, or something like FX Photos, a photo manager, uh, something like that. And that all should work like online and offline. So it should be a local first kind of experience uh, where you can be offline for an extended period of time. Um, and I think of this as like a data backpack because it's really about user agency. Um, and it is about user agency, and I, and I think of that as a backpack because you can take it anywhere. You control where, who you share stuff with from your backpack. And um, at the end of the day, for us, this means you have control over the keys that are used to encrypt the back backpack or give write access to different parts of it, right? But this turns out to be kind of difficult to build, um, especially because of this. Uh, the browser is quite a hostile environment, right? You have, I don't know, mal malicious extensions, uh, you have cross-site scripting attacks, code injection, um, supply chain problems, and yeah, so at the end of the day, every time we tell people that we're doing this from the browser, they're like, what? You're putting keys into the browser? What are you doing? Um, but yeah, we, we do do that. Um, the Web Crypto API, for one, is like amazing, and uh, thanks, Dietrich, for the work on like ED25519. I'm excited for that. Um, and non-extractable non key pairs are, are what makes all of this possible, uh, as good as possible, essentially. Uh, what that means, though, is that, well, uh, you need to have like an asymmetric key pair for every device, because non-extractability basically means you can't take the private key and actually read it, the bytes. All you have is like some kind of JavaScript reference to something that allows you to sign or to encrypt. Uh, but it also gives you revocability. So no, no malicious code, cross-site scripting, or extension can like take your private key and steal it forever. You'll always be able to revoke things that were signed or uh, encrypt things differently when they were once encrypted or decrypted with your key, essentially. Um, but yeah, with decryption, this doesn't work that well. Uh, once you decrypt something once, uh, of course, the data needs to be readable inside the context of your browser. So uh, what do you do there? Well, we were thinking the best you can do is probably uh, using the principle of least authority. I mean, sandboxes are another uh, kind of way of trying to solve this issue, but that's what we were going for. So essentially, in this context, what I mean by uh, this principle of least authority is you want really, really fine-grained access control on all of your data. When I go to an image editor app, what I want to have is basically I just give the image editor only the image that I want to edit and no read or write access to anything else. So that's what we mean by it. Or if you have some kind of compute job that you want to run somewhere else, well, you give them your file system, but you give them just a snapshot of what, they need, what the computation needs to know about from your file system. Uh, another thing with browsers is persistence. So your browser may just decide to throw away your data uh, which is kind of not ideal. Um, so that means that key recovery becomes a problem because what if your browser actually holds your keys like we have them in Web Crypto? So you need to think about key recovery. This talk is not about that, uh, but I'm mentioning it for completeness sake. Um, but it also means that encrypted data is per needs to be persisted somewhere else. Um, that's why we put it on IPFS. Uh, we want to have, like, let's say, a pinning service or a storage provider or someone should be able to 
um, persist your data, uh, but it also means this is another point of where it's becoming very difficult because now it's kind of public data. You may or may not trust or to different uh, levels you trust a certain storage provider or pinning API. Uh, so the, the data that is stored there should be like leaking as little information as possible. So let's gather up those requirements of what we were trying to build. Um, so we wanted to have fine-grained access control. We wanted to store data with untrusted peers, which means minimizing leaked information. For example, the file hierarchy shouldn't be uh, readable from reading like all of the uh, encrypted data. Uh, we should have, um, we want to actually verify valid writes without read access because let's say you have some kind of storage provider, they keep around like your latest state of the file system and they will be the, the entity that most uh, peers will interact with when they have updates in order to share them. And so uh, ideally they would be able to like uh, figure out which ones of those are actually valid writes, which one are actually um, signed by something that originated in a user's key. Uh, so we are using UCANs for that, plus also something else that we've built into WinFS. Uh, and finally, another problem that happens when you have like a bunch of devices or you're interacting with a bunch of other people when you're sharing data or sharing access to data is that you will have concurrent rights. So those are all of the things that we're trying to solve with WinFS. All right, how do we make this work? So in this section of the talk, I wanna like give you, with an example, kind of a, a small peek into what happens uh, underneath the covers, right? So here's back, Queenie, in her uh, novel style. Um, and she, she has a bunch of files, right? She has like some notes on her thesis. She also has a uh, rendered thesis. And she, she also stores a love letter in her file system. Obviously, some of these things she wants to share with some people and some of these things she doesn't want to share with other people. Um, and actually, we don't only store like the, the latest versions of files, we actually store all of the history. So if she accidentally deletes something, she can recover it. Um, and in general, you have this kind of macOS time machine-like uh, environment where you can always go back and look at what the state was before. or if you're a developer, maybe Git makes a lot of sense in that case. Um, but actually, Winnie is very, very uh, tidy. So she uh, organizes her data in the file system with a directory hierarchy, and she separates her work from her life stuff. Um, and now, if she wants to share something, she wants to be able to, for example, only give access to this final rendered thesis for her professor. Uh, but if she has a work computer, she actually wants to be able to easily have the work computer access everything in her work directory. Um, so how do we do that? Well, for one, we encrypt all of the files uh, with different keys. So every file having a different key means that if you have the key for one file, you won't be able to read anything else, obviously. Um, and that also means, though, that now you have to like juggle all of these keys. So what do you do? You build hierarchies on top of that. So one of the things, uh, one of the ways we do this is we, for, for revisions, uh, every time you write a new file uh, revision, you want, don't want to do another key uh, sharing, like uh, basically dance with someone else. So you organize these keys in a ratchet. So ratchet will give you a, a different key for every revision, but in a deterministic way. If you share the state of the ratchet, someone will be able to derive all future keys. But it also gives us this distinction between these two access levels where you can have access to a single revision of a file only, or you can have access to, let's say, the skip ratchet on the bottom left, which will allow you to derive the key for that revision, or go up one step further into, uh, in the skip ratchet and get that uh, revisions key and so on for any future keys. And now this gives us like the distinction between temporal and snapshot access levels. Oh, and by the way, uh, we're using a skip ratchet for this, uh, which is an invention by Brooke, and there's a paper about it. Uh, and if you're interested in these kinds of things, it's super fun, uh, read it. Um, so yeah, we, we now have this distinction between temporal and snapshot access levels. Um, but we also want a hierarchical kind of access level so that, for example, if she has a work computer, she can just have a single key she shares with her work computer once, and at that point, uh, it will have access and read all future kind of uh, values in or files and directories in the work directory without having to do another key, uh, key sharing dance, right? 
Um, so the way we do this is we use a basic crypt tree uh, kind of structure where we put the keys of the files into the directory and then we encrypt it and then we get more keys and we do this recursively up to the root, right? Now at this point, we basically just have a set of files and a bunch of keys. Well, we have one root key that will be able to discover all of the hierarchy, but for now, these aren't really like uh, organized in any kind of uh, structure. They're kind of in a flat namespace, but um, ideally, uh, in order to like link to stuff, you can either use SIDS or we use, in this case, something else to enable uh, verified uh, writes without read access. Um, and the way we do this is we give all of these ciphertexts a meaningful label. Right now, I've put like the file path as a label, which obviously <laughs> uh, is leaking a lot of information about these files or these ciphertexts. Uh, and but but it, from there, I'll, I'll get onto how we do this so we we actually hide what the path is. So first of all, we start with these uh, paths. I will actually make them absolute paths, but then we'll replace every path segment with a random number. So every file now stores uh, both, well, this random number, because in practice it's gonna be a 256-bit number, um, as well as the human readable name uh, for entries inside directories, let's say. Uh, we call these numbers I numbers. Uh, I think this is a term, if I'm not mistaken, from the web back then. Um, it's, it's a fun idea, read about it maybe. Um, but basically, yeah, we call these I numbers. And then finally, well, this also still leaks information. Well, we don't know what exactly these files are supposed to be, but you see, oh, well, there's a hierarchy in the files, and I see that some things are in the same directory. That still leaks information. So finally, we uh, take out of these um, file segments, or I numbers, and we hash them together to basically get something that deterministically derives a, a label for each ciphertext. And we also add in the key or something that is derived from the key, so it's unique per revision of a file, into that uh, hash. That gives us a very constant size uh, identifier for all files and even for across revisions. And actually, this is not probably a hash function as you are thinking of it. It is not SHA2, SHA3, or Blake3, or whatever. Uh, that's why I put an asterisk in here. We're actually using RSA accumulators for this, which means that if you're sharing um, write access with someone else, you can sign something that is going to look like random stuff, uh, but the person who received that certificate will be able to present that to a storage provider and or a pinning service, whatever, that is aware of WinFS and will be able to prove that it only did writes to paths that contained some subset in this hash, essentially, right? But more on that is <laughs> much more complicated. Uh, talk to me afterwards if you're interested in that. So uh, now we have all of these, uh, these files. They're actually in kind of like a flat data structure. And finally, we put a, an IPLD hand on top. And so we get a root SID, something to pin, uh, something to contain all of your data. Ta-da. We call this data structure a uh, private forest, or sometimes jokingly a dark forest because technically you don't know what other trees are in there. And in practice, we actually, actually use this property. So basically, this is just a collection of things that you care about, and you may have one or two or three or whatever uh, trees inside of that. So what do we get from this? Well, we're trying to leak as little metadata as possible. You just have a flat namespace. If you have no read access, you just see a bunch of files, um, ciphertext, more precisely. The labels of them don't mean anything to you unless you can read the data. Uh, the hierarchy is scrambled, and also we split files in practice uh, into multiple chunks. So, so you can't like distinguish a 512 kilobyte file from like two 256 kilobyte files, and you can't in general like see bigger files. We act also get very fine grained access control by the crypt tree method, as you saw. Basically, you can share different parts of your file system with different keys, and you have very succinct things that you can share. Like uh, sharing something means literally giving someone. Uh, like 200 bytes maybe, and uh, they'll be able to read some subpart of your tree. Uh, well, and additionally, of course, they need to fetch everything else over IPFS. Uh, we have like different levels there. We have a snapshot and temporal level, and that holds for like both files and directories. So you can have a snapshot uh, access to a whole directory or a whole uh, like revision of the complete file system, for example. 
we also get write verification without read access. But remember one thing that, that I mentioned uh, in the beginning that, we didn't, that I didn't mention yet in there, and that's concurrent writes. So what we do about that. Say so you have a bunch of devices and uh, they're doing stuff on their own, and now you need to reconcile these changes that they did in case they didn't communicate with each other. But you have this problem that the person or the, the peer that is trying to reconcile all these changes may not be able to read them. So what do you do? So here you have one device. It did a bunch of writes. It created this hand. Uh, you have another device. It did a bunch of writes. And on the one hand, it created some other data. Like you can see that some of the uh, labels overlap and some don't. And in some way, they uh, create like conflicting data uh, where the labels overlap. And um, basically, someone who has to reconcile these changes is like, OK, now what do I do? Do I take the left to the right? Um, basically, what we say is uh, you just merge them together. And we actually don't use normal maps, but we are making it a multi-map. So <laughs> you just store both revisions. Uh, that's the whole trick. Uh, but now, obviously, that means you're pushing the problem to the read time because you're trying to read this label, but you're getting like multiple ciphertexts. Uh, it essentially means you're trying to read a directory, but you're actually getting multiple. So what do you do? Well, you'll see, okay, now, now you have read access, though, when you're trying to access this. So you can see, oh, okay, so there's two different revisions, uh, two different directories in the same revision. Um, they seem to be referring to, uh, like, content-wise seem to be not the same, so I can't just take one of them. Uh, in fact, they seem to link to two different uh, versions of a subdirectory at path A. So I go down there, and I look at these two different subdirectories. And again, uh, I can't merge them since one of them uh, seems to be different from the other. So one of them has, like, a file inside of it, x.png, the other one has y.png. But now, like, merging them together would be pretty easy, right? The, the obvious thing to do is just create a directory that has both of these changes. So that's what we do. In the next revision, we just create a directory that uh, contains both of these things. And um, we go back in, uh, towards the root and fix all of these links so that in the next revision, you actually fix all of these issues. We also add in links back into uh, the previous versions so that you can still follow the history and figure out what happened. And this also enables like deletes to be preserved. And in general, is basically, if I'm hand-waving here a little bit, the CRDT clock that makes all of this work. All right, so with that, we're getting concurrent write access, uh, uh, sorry, concurrent write reconciliation. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically all we wanted. Um, but where are we actually at? Uh, because not everything in the, that I've talked about yet has been implemented. So maybe let's give you an overview of what is there uh, at this point in time. So here's some example code. Uh, we, we have created a Rust implementation, RS WinFS, that is supposed to be very, very, very portable. So you can compile it to a Wasm. There exist bindings for SwiftUI and Android. So there's people who have been using it for iOS apps and Android apps. Uh, and we're using it at Fission inside the browser. Uh, yeah, here's like you can, you can find it on uh, Docs.rs. Uh, and here's the implementation inside of the working, uh, WinFS working group, group organization. Um, it is extremely portable because we've abstracted out a bunch of things that are like very, um, very context specific or host specific, specifically that storage network. So you basically just provide a block store with uh, get block and put, put block as the interface. And uh, what we give you is all the DAG surgery and encryption that you need to do. And also you need to like provide a, like the secret storage externally. So that is going to be very host dependent, of course. What you get is a read and write and create directory and all of that APIs, essentially all of the DAC surgery. Um, yeah, so let's look at some code. So this is some Rust code. Uh, these aren't like, these are APIs exist in this way and you can run this code, but we are in the process of improving this, uh, these APIs so they are more usable and uh, yeah, more easy to use basically. Um, but yeah, this, this works today. You can like, you create some randomness, so you, it randomly generates keys for new files and new directories. Uh, you uh, create some block store. Here we're just using some in-memory block store, and you create this forest to put private data into, and there's a new directory. You can um, 
create some stuff in this directory. For example, here is a, an mkdir uh, command that creates a pictures slash cats kind of directory. You also give it the time at which it was created and all of the access to all of the things that it needs. Um, you can write some data to it. For example, here's a picture of Billy the dog. Um, actually, it's not a picture, it's just, it just says hello world, but well, I couldn't fit the picture quite in there. Um, and then you can do something like ls and read what's inside of the pictures directory and print that. And finally, you can serialize uh, the whole file system and get the root SID, and that's something you could send to a pending API, for example. So yeah, the output of that is that um, in the console. You can see uh, lsing something gives you like all of the entries in there and some metadata about it when they were created, when they were last modified, and these kind of things. And also I put up a QR code here. What you'll get is, <laughs> I see people happily um, scanning this, but they're, they'll be disappointed when they see it's just a car file. Um, <laughs> or basically just a very, very unreadable DAG Seaborg kind of DAG, which is basically the private forest, but look into it and you'll just see a bunch of random looking data, which is exactly the point. Um, all right. Uh, also, I, I'll be sharing the, the, the slides and the link at the bottom is clickable. So we do have a public roadmap. So what is implemented? Uh, we're, we've, we've implemented um, basically all the private file sharing stuff that I haven't talked about yet that much. Um, we have uh, some things that we're working on uh, this quarter. We were also working on the RSA accumulator stuff on this day. So uh, that isn't quite finished yet, uh, but we're getting there. The spec is basically ready. Um, it's just an implementation matter now. And also we're starting in this, this quarter now, we're starting on conflict reconciliation stuff um, and also big data set support, for example. So if you want to store like, 10,000 entry directories, that's gonna be a bit harder for us. We'll need to figure out sharding directories there, uh, and so that's something we haven't done yet. If you're interested in these kind of things, this is a community project. So this is the whole idea, right? So you, you come and get involved with us, uh, we'll figure something out. This has worked in the past. So for example, uh, the function land folks uh, have created this FX Photos app. So this is powered by RS Winifas in the background. Uh, it's connected to MetaMask as like the secrets kind of storage um, thing. Um, it, it stores a bunch of photos uh, that you can upload and it encrypts them and puts them on IPFS. Um, so that's these people here. And they have created the Swift and the Android bindings in order to create these apps. We've also worked together with Banyan very recently and they've already been happily uh, creating pull requests and uh, contributing to RS Winifest, which I'm super glad about. So yeah, uh, that's basically what it is. Come, use it, talk to us, and get involved. Thank you. Any questions? We have plenty of time, of, uh, plenty of time for questions. Is the mic working? Okay, this is better. Uh, yeah, so you showed a picture of the conflict uh, resolution when there were two different files added, which is obviously the easy case. What do you do if there are two files added with the same name? So how do you do conflict resolution in that case? Yeah, so the interesting thing in that case is, well, we need to do it automatically, obviously, or we strive to do it automatically. So what we do is we compare the hashes and use the lower hash. The, the most important thing for us is it's going to be consistent uh, across like all of your devices. What you can do on top and what we're planning to do is once you have these, uh, these automatic merges, a app that maybe knows how to, let's say it's not images, but instead it is actually some app data, some JSON, and the app knows how to reconcile changes from like concurrent writes, then the app can go into the history of this file. It can see, oh yeah, there was an automatic merge. It will go into the history, see the two versions that were merged, and it will put on top like another revision, another write, where these, uh, these files were actually merged in, in the right way. Well, the problem we're trying to solve here is like we can't 
have the correct CRDT for all apps, obviously. Um, so we need each app to do it in their own unique way. So, but the history is available via the API, so you can basically query the history and figure out yes. how to do an app-specific merge. Okay, thanks. Yes, exactly. There's another question over there. Um, I have a question uh, with regard to the um, write permission management. Um, does each uh, drive or file system have something like a um, like a did or a unique identifier at the root, or how do you delegate actually permissions to it? Because so far it was all just SIDs, which are immutable, of course. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the system that we're at the end of the day, our SwinFS is very agnostic about all of that. So for example, the function land folks have uh, based their whole system around like wallets and the wallets being like the, the way that you do um, verifying these rights and how you store the secrets, et cetera, et cetera. What we've been doing at Fission is we've had like a root, um, a root pointer that is controlled by a certain DID and we will use UCANs to delegate to different DIDs that may represent more devices uh, and uh, yeah, basically that, that is stored externally at the point where you have the, the basic the mutable pointer for your file system, right? You could also imagine uh, that being controlled by uh, IPNS, but at that point uh, you, you need some extra capabilities in order to make use of, let's say, the verified uh, rights without read permissioning. Because, well, IPNS, of course, only checks if it is a SID written by uh, a certain public key or signed by a certain public key. And is the idea that um, in RS uh, WNFS, um, there would be, like, if you open um, um, a file system, that it would check all the capabilities in there, or is that externalized to an app on top? Like, if I, if I get some SID and I know the, the root key, would I be able to, to check if all writes in there are actually had the capability to do these writes? Yes. Uh, so there's kind of two different levels. At the moment, what we have is not a... Uh, what, what we're working towards is a kind of like authorized data structure, uh, WinFS approach, where you can actually just grab a certain SID that is supposed to be a WinFS, and you can go through it and you can just verify that its state relative some, to some DID that you know is valid. We're not there today, but that's basically on the roadmap is, one sec, is the peer-to-peer -peer write verification implementation thing. 